Okay, let's start. So you know who I am, I'm sure, Dr. Goyon. My students call me Poppy. I prefer that, actually. That's what my grandchildren call me. Okay, just uh, some ideas about how to study this. Uh, you don't use the pathology from Kaplan, you use this. Okay, that's why you got it for. That's why you came. Okay, I'm sure that you looked at the first part, which basically is high yield. Now, when I say high yield, what does that mean? It means it's uh, generated from students that have taken the exam previously and their topics that were on their test. And so there's high yield in anatomy, everything except behavioral science in here. Some of you that have taken the exam will recognize many of the questions you had on it. Uh, many people that have taken the test that have gone through these high yield have seen quite a few questions on their test. Because there's only a certain number of ways they can ask a question. And so I've got a lot of the ones they've asked here. Study it and know it absolutely cold. Backwards, forwards, and inside out. Okay, and that's probably the most important thing there. There's even more high yields in the actual book itself. So that's very, very, very important that you go through the high yields. I can't believe that some people that have taken this course did not go all the way through the high yield, and then I saw them again the next time. Okay, I said, did you go through the high yield? Well, not really. There you go. Okay. So they're high yield because they come from students, not because I'm some kind of genius and can figure out and read their minds. Okay? So uh, make sure you do those. Also, you'll see questions there. They're questions that actually come from high yield. And they're questions on each of the topics that I cover. And if I were you, the way I would do this, I would not try to follow me in the book because I don't feel any obligation to go through everything in this book. I can't actually do all of pathology in 40 hours or I guess if you subtract the, the breaks and stuff like that, it's a little close to 30 hours. It's impossible. So all I can do is pick out the most important things that I think that you should hear. The rest of it uh, is something that you can read at your own leisure. My suggestion is to listen to me and not write. You don't have to write a single thing. Everything you need to know is in there. So why would you need to write? In terms of what's important, everything's important. So, you know, forget the underlining because you need a paintbrush. <laughs> you just start at the top and go straight down, okay? I mean, to underline an individual thing. Guys, these notes were, took 25 years to put together over time. And it dwindled down to the absolute quintessence. I mean, it's like an espresso. You know, I mean, you know, you can just maybe have a little drop and you're already fixed, okay? It's got it all there. So there's no reason to underline anything. Everything's important. There's no reason to look at it while I'm talking because you're going to do one or the other. You're going to either look at it or you're going to listen. You can't do both. My suggestion is to listen. And then what you do at the end of the day is you go through the questions that I have on that subject. And you have answers to them, okay? If you can answer those questions, then there's no real re reason to go and read the notes, is there? <laughs> and so that's how you do it. You listen carefully and attentively. Then uh, in, the, uh, in the evening or during breaks, you start trying to answer the questions. Okay, there's 300 and something of them there. There's quite a few questions there. And that's how I do it. I also gave you... Um, Always, people always, always asking about pictures. You know, I, I can't give you my pictures because they're all copyrighted. Okay, some of you don't understand copyright. You think anything you can just copy. Okay, you can't. Okay, and so I took Robin's textbook. Most people have that pathology book, sixth edition, and you got an extra handout that goes to the page and the illustration of the picture in the Robin's textbook that could potentially be a picture like it on the exam. For those that are interested in, in uh, you know, they, they've got to have pictures. Okay, well, I looked all the way through Robbins and I picked out their best pictures of things that have been on the exam. Not the exact picture, the ones uh, that they usually put the exact picture, the ones I have, because they come from existing pathology sets. So you even got that. Okay, so 
I think, let's see, anything else in there? That's about it. That's what I would suggest that you do. All right? Now, we, uh, we break every 50 minutes for exactly 10 minutes. I have a little, a little clock there. When that 10 minutes is up, I start. I don't care. You know, I could be talking to you. I will stop in mid-sentence, and we will begin. Okay? Um, we've got to have some kind of order. Otherwise, you get up, you know, sitting up here all day answering questions instead of lecturing. Okay? Uh, in terms of the questions that you may want to ask me, please uh, uh, limit it to the stuff that we're talking about. Not about your grandma with this disease or that. Okay? That's not what we're here for. Okay, not about even part two, okay? Not even about part two. We're here for part one, okay? So limit the questions to what we're talking about now, okay? And that way, uh, other people can get an opportunity to ask a question. Probably shouldn't be a whole lot of questions because I think it's pretty clear stuff. But whatever. That's the way we work it, okay? Please, no questions during class. I mean, obviously, with this many people, with probably 800 different dialects here, Okay, it would be very difficult to be able to answer those questions. So you save them until the breaks. Uh, usually I come in a little early during the lunchtime, you know, when we come back maybe 15 minutes before it starts. I stay maybe 5 or 10 minutes after uh, 5 o'clock. We go all the way to 5. And uh, you should get your, your questions answered. But most of the questions that you would have are answered already in the book. I've heard every single question that there has been asked. So I anticipate them, and so most of the time, it really won't be necessary, okay? So that's it. Ready to go? Okay, let's start up. If we could uh, just have to press this, okay. Cell injury is the first topic. Very important. Key issues in cell injury deal with hypoxia, getting into things like uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, cyanide poisoning, and things of that nature. And probably the next biggest thing would be apoptosis is a hot topic right now, and free radicals, so we'll uh, go through those. And then uh, growth alterations, that's big time, okay, atrophy, hyperplasia, that kind of stuff. So those are the things we'll concentrate on in this chapter. First thing is terms. When I said hypoxia, the first thing that should have come through your mind is inadequate oxygenation of tissue, which is basically the same definition as shock, okay? Now, then remember, why do we need oxygen? We need oxygen for the oxidative phosphorylation pathway. That's where we get ATP from. That's in the mitochondria. In fact, it's specifically in the inner mitochondrial membrane is where the electron transport system is called oxidative phosphorylation. Remember, the last reaction is oxygen to receive the electron. So oxygen is an electron acceptor, as you recall. Protons are being kicked off that electron transport system eventually end up going back into the membrane and forming ATP. It's just that simple. That's why we need oxygen. So basically it all boils down to we need oxygen for ATP. Okay? And the ATP is mainly generated in the mitochondria. Pretty, pretty simple concept. I know you haven't had biochemistry. You fortunately have the best biochemistry teacher around, Dr. Hansen. She's the one that wrote the notes on biochemistry, and I think they're pretty good. All right, some oxygen terms. You need to know oxygen content. You may have had this from Passel already, since he did respiratory. This is important because it's important for you to understand what carries oxygen. Okay, and this formula actually goes through that. It's, well, you forget the number. That's irrelevant. It's the hemoglobin, which is the most important of the three things, times the oxygen saturation, which a lot of you don't understand, plus the partial pressure of arterial oxygen. Okay, so these are the three main things that carry oxygen in our blood, hemoglobin. And then on that hemoglobin, the oxygen attached to the heme group, that's called oxygen saturation. And then the amount of oxygen that's actually dissolved in plasma, that's the partial pressure of arterial oxygen. Okay, if you want to just a, a visual of what oxygen saturation is, is, this is a red blood cell. Remember, there's four heme groups. Iron has to be plus two, if you recall. If it's plus three, cannot cannot carry oxygen. And so if all four heme groups on, uh, on, a, on hemoglobin are occupied by oxygen, on every one of the red blood cells, the oxygen saturation is 100%. So it's the oxygen in the red blood cell attached to the heme group. That's oxygen saturation. That's what you measure with a pulse oximeter. 
The partial pressure of oxygen is the oxygen dissolved in your plasma. Okay. So how does the oxygen flow? It flows from the alveoli through the interface. It dissolves in the plasma, increases the partial pressure of oxygen. That's what this is. It diffuses through the red blood cell membrane and attaches to the heme groups on the uh, red blood cell, on the hemoglobin. That's your oxygen saturation. So you should therefore understand that if the partial pressure of oxygen is decreased, what has to happen to the oxygen saturation, please? It has to be decreased. Because where did it get its oxygen from? The amount that was dissolved in plasma. That should be perfectly obvious to you. Okay. So those are your terms, guys, that you must know to understand tissue hypoxia. Okay, one of the first causes of tissue hypoxia is ischemia. This is another definition. Ischemia, recall, is a decrease in arterial blood flow. Not venous, arterial. Now, the most common cause of, uh, of ischemia is a thrombus in a muscular artery, because that's the most common cause of death in the United States, in my accordion, unfortunately. That's a classic example of ischemia. Got a thrombus, that's blocking arterial blood flow, producing tissue hypoxia, right? And so that's the most common cause of ischemia, is a thrombus. Uh, in a muscular artery, but how about a decrease in cardiac output for whatever reason? A hypovolemia, cardiogenic shock, would that qualify as tissue hypoxia, as uh, ischemia? Sure, because you have a decrease in arterial blood flow. Okay. The second uh, most common cause of tissue hypoxia is hypoxemia. It has a lot of books and a lot of students think that hypoxia and hypoxemia are the same. No, 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 no. Hypoxia is the big term. Hypoxemia is a cause of hypoxia. They're not the same. Hypoxemia deals with the partial pressure of arterial oxygen, which I've already just defined for you. That's the oxygen dissolved in plasma, arterial plasma. That's the partial pressure of oxygen. When that is decreased, that is called hypoxemia. Okay. Now, you've had PASO. You've had him for respiratory. No, you haven't had him for cardiovascular. He's outstanding. I know everything he teaches. Okay, he's a good friend of mine. And so I know that he's taught you this. He's taught you ventilation, perfusion, and diffusion. <laughs> he's taught you the alveolar arterial gradient, the AA gradient. He's taught you that already. So it's not necessary to have to repeat those things, even though we will. <laughs> okay? Why? Because some people, it goes in one ear and out the other. If that's you, then what you need is to put a little, little plug in one ear, and then it stays in there. Okay, to make sure the ear that's open is faced towards me and it'll just stay in your brain. What he may not have talked about is respiratory acidosis to, to, to the, to, in this regard, in terms of hypoxemia. It's Dalton's law, guys. So some of the partial pressures of the gas must equal 760 at, uh, at uh, atmospheric pressure. We have oxygen, CO2, and nitrogen. Nitrogen remains constant. So when you retain CO2, carbon dioxide, that's respiratory acidosis. You already knew that. But what has to happen to the PO2 when the CO2 goes up? It has to go down. It has to. It's not, it's, not a, it's not, well, I think I'm going to go down. No, you're going down because you still have to come out with 760. So every time you have respiratory acidosis from any cause, any cause, you have hypoxemia. You have a low PO2, arterial PO2. Have to. CO2 goes up, what goes down? And vice versa. CO2 goes down, respiratory alkalosis, what happens to PO2? Goes up. Has to. Okay, so there's that inverse relationship. Now, you know, uh, in terms of ventilation defects, probably the best example of a ventilation defect is respiratory distress syndrome, another name, hyaline membrane disease. The adult variety is called adult respiratory distress syndrome. And that's producing a ventilation defect, which you already know about because Passel taught you. But you, you've lost ventilation to the alveoli, but what do you still have? Perfusion. So you have no ventilation, but you have perfusion. What have you created? An intrapulmonary shunt. You all know that. How are you going to recognize it on an exam? Very simple. You'll have a patient with hypoxemia. They say they gave him 100% oxygen. 20 minutes, and the PO2 didn't increase. I mean, duh! What does it have? What does it mean? 
I mean, you got a shot. <laughs> God. I mean, that's so simple. The student's sitting there, oh, I went to, what's going on here? Never heard about this. I mean, come on. I mean, it's not hard. They didn't give them oxygen. Well, that's a possibility. They thought they were, but they didn't. But that's kind of reading into the question. Okay, so that's how you can tell whether you have a shunt going on there. You give 100% oxygen, the PO2 doesn't go up. Come on. There's a massive ventilation defect there. And if it's a little dude, it's hyaline membrane disease. If it's an adult, it's adult respiratory distress syndrome, period. Okay, we have perfusion defects. Okay, that means you knock off blood flow. Well, you know the most common perfusion defect, don't you? I could have got it on the stinking plane coming here because it was over two hours. Pulmonary embolus. That's going to be a board question, guys. It's on the radio all over the place. You know, prolonged flights and sitting down and not getting up. Why? They tell you to sit down. <laughs> you can't get up. It's choppy weather. You know, i got to go pee. No, sit. Okay? Well, you're sitting there. You get some stasis in your deep veins of your leg. Get a little propagation of a clot. And five days later or three days later, you throw off an embolus. That's a perfusion defect. So now we have ventilation, but we have no perfusion. That's increasing what? Come on, though. You're going to do pass so poor bad if you don't uh, give me the answer. That's space. So perfusion defects produce an increase in dead space. Ventilation defects produce intrapulmonary shunts. Very simple stuff. Now, if you give oxygen, 100% oxygen to someone with a perfusion defect, you will get the PO2 up. Why? Because not, that not every single vessel in the lung is, is, uh, is not perfused, so other areas of the lung can make up for the difference. So that you can easily separate then a ventilation from a perfusion de by, uh, de defect by giving oxygen, 100%. If it doesn't go up, it's a ventilation defect. You've got intrapulmonary shunting. If it eventually increases, then you know you've got a, you got a, a, a perfusion defect with dead space problem. The third thing is a diffusion defect. That's where you have something in the interface that oxygen can't get through. Like what? Like fibrosis. Probably the best example is sarcoidosis, a restrictive lung disease. Oxygen has enough trouble getting through the stupid membranes. You put fibrosis there, it really has a problem. We have pulmonary edema. How's oxygen to get through all that crap? Can't. So you have a diffusion defect. Or just plain old fluid, like in heart failure. You know, when you get that initial um, uh, dyspnea in a patient with heart failure because you've activated the J, J as a jerk, J reflex, uh, innervated by the 10th nerve. With fluid or anything innervates that J receptor, what happens is you get dyspnea. Okay, that's kind of like you're trying to take a breath, but you can't take a full breath. That's because you stimulated the J receptor and you can't take that full breath and it produces dyspnea. That's because you have fluid in that, in that interstitium of the lung and, and, are, and are irritating the J receptor. That's a board question, too. Everything I've said so far is on boards. Okay, so these are the four things that produce hypoxemia. Okay, all of which you already know, I think. But I'm just putting it into a different con context than maybe Dr. Paso did. We're not done with hypoxia yet. You can have hemoglobin-related problems causing hypoxia. Of course, anemia would be a classic one, wouldn't it? And if you looked at oxygen content, you can then they said, you know, you know, and, uh, you know, what would you expect in a patient with anemia? And one of the classic things that students always fall for is a decrease in PO2. They think that you have hypoxemia when you have anemia. Of course you don't. Don't you have normal gas exchange in a patient with anemia? Sure. So the PO2 should be normal. The oxygen saturation should be normal. But what's decreased? Hemoglobin. That's what anemia is. You still have normal respiration, so the PO2 is normal, the oxygen saturation is normal. Common mistake. But boy, you get a 5 gram hemoglobin, you don't have a whole lot of oxygen to give the tissue, do you? Because you have decreased hemoglobin. You might have a normal oxygen saturation, a normal PO2, but you only have 5 grams of hemoglobin. You ain't carrying a whole lot. So you have tissue hypoxia. That's why they have exertional dyspnea when you have anemia. Exercise intolerance. Because you have tissue hypoxia from a decrease in hemoglobin. Then we get into our little friends carbon monoxide and, and methemoglobinemia. Carbon monoxide is on every board. You all know that. 
you just have to recognize how they're going to how they're going to present it. Well, the big one is usually a, a heater in the winter time. Uh, you know, these little room heaters oftentimes have, have combustible material in them, and you can get carbon monoxide from that. You're in a closed space with a room heater. That's a favorite one that they ask. Automobile exhaust, of course, is another one, but another big one's a house fire. In fact, there's two things that produce tissue hypoxia in a house fire. One is carbon monoxide poisoning because of the few of the combustible things. The other one is cyanide poisoning because upholstery is made out of polyurethane products. Okay, when there's heat, you, know, you get uh, cyanide gas given off. So patients that come out of house fires commonly have both carbon monoxide and cyanide poisoning. That's very important. So they get two for one. Now remember, carbon monoxide is very, very diffusible. It has a very high affinity for hemoglobin. Okay, but this oftentimes also causes confusions with students. Okay, what does it mean? basically means that the problem is going to be oxygen saturation is going to be decreased because it's sitting on the heme group rather than oxygen. I mean, you can recite for me a 210 times greater affinity for hemoglobin, and then you don't know what it means. What it means is it's sitting on the heme group instead of oxygen. That's what it means. That means oxygen saturation is decreased. Period. That's the only thing that's decreased. Hemoglobin is certainly normal. It's not anemia. And the oxygen does, and the PO2, the amount dissolved in uh, oxygen dissolved in plants, are totally normal. The problem is, is that when it when it diffuses into the red blood cell, carbon monoxide sitting on its place. It's like someone taking your seat during a break, and you come back and someone's there. All right. Every time you see that happen, from now on, you say, "Hey, you carbon monoxide. I'm I'm 100% oxygen. I'm displacing you now." Okay. So then you get two for one for that. You know how to treat it with 100% oxygen. You know that if someone's sitting in your seat, it's decreasing oxygen saturation. And then, unfortunately, you recall that when you have a decrease in oxygen saturation, you have clinical evidence of cyanosis. You all knew that, too. When they say cyanosis, basically what they're saying is, is that you have a decrease in oxygen saturation. That's what gives you cyanosis. But why don't you see that in carbon monoxide poisoning? Because of that red pigment. That cherry red pigment masks it. That's what makes it such a hard diagnosis to make. The most common symptom that was on board is headache. That's the first symptom of carbon monoxide poisoning is headache. It's all in your notes. Okay, met hemoglobin is very interesting. Uh, I think it was unfair the way they asked it the first time. Lately, they've been asking the Datsone question. First, what is met hemoglobin? It's iron plus three, not plus two. So if iron is plus three on the heme group, then oxygen can't bind to it. So the only thing that's screwed up with methemoglobin poisoning is oxygen saturation again. Okay, That's because the iron's plus three rather than plus two. But oxygen saturation's decreased. If, they're, if, they're, if you're lucky, they may give you a history in a patient with methemoglobinemia that they draw blood and it's chocolate colored. That's because there's no oxygen on the, on the, uh, on the heme groups. The PO2 is totally normal. The hemoglobin concentration is totally normal. It's the oxygen saturation. So in other words, the seat's empty, but you can't sit in it, okay, and stay there because it's plus three, okay, not plus two. That's why red blood cells have a methemoglobin reductase system. Okay, you'll find out where that's located in biochemistry, but it's basically right where you make NADH, about halfway down in the glycolytic cycle. Right there is where the methemoglobin reductase system is, and it can convert by reduction, can reduce plus three back to plus two. The question, that there's two questions that they use for methemoglobinemia. One was a dude coming out of the Rocky Mountains, and he was cyanotic. They gave him oxygen, and he was still cyanotic. I guess you have to just really read in between the lines, because that's all the history they give you. Probably drinking water up there in the mountains, and the water oftentimes up in the mountains is loaded with nitrites and nitrates. These are oxidizing agents. And what they do is they oxidize hemoglobin, and so the iron becomes plus three rather than plus two. The tip off was the fact that giving oxygen didn't correct the cyanosis. Okay? And you had to arrive at the fact that it was probably a methemoglobinemia. And then they wanted to know what the treatment was, which is IV methylene blue. 
Uh, an ancillary but not the primary treatment is vitamin C. Vitamin C, you recall, is a reducing agent. But that's not your main treatment. It's intravenous methylene blue. The, ne the most recent one for methemoglobinemia was Dapsone. Dapsone, as you know, is used in treating leprosy. It's in your high yield. Don't worry about it. You'll see it. Dapsone. Dapsone is a sulfur drug. Sulfa and nitro drugs, guys. Sulfa and nitro drugs do two things. I want you to tie this together. One is they produce methemoglobin. Two is that they have the potential for producing hemolytic anemia and glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. So when they talk about hemolysis and G6PD deficiency, they're talking about oxidizing agents, okay? causing an increase in peroxide, which destroys the red blood cell. And it's interesting, the same drugs that can produce hemolysis and G6PD deficiency are nitro and sulfa drugs, okay? And they're also the same kind of drugs that produce methemoglobin. So it's possible when, uh, when you have uh, exposure to Dapsone or Primaquin or Trimethoprim sulfamethoxol or nitro drugs, nitroglycerin, nitroprusside, whatever, you can have a combination of the hemolytic anemia, G6PD deficiency, and methemoglobinemia because they're oxidizing agents. Do you understand that? Okay. Very common, by the way, to see methemoglobinemia in HIV. Why? Great board question. Come on. Because they're on trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole for treatment of what? Come on. Pneumocystis carini. There you go. So what is the potential complication of that therapy, please? That hemoglobinemia, right? That's an integration, guys. That's the kind of stuff the boards is made up of. I feel so sorry for the boards people, don't you? <laughs> Not really. More, more, more. Okay. It's all on your notes. The more you read, the higher the score. Pretty simple. The less you read, the lower the score. Very, very simple. Straight log. Straight up. Guaranteed. Okay. Get through the notes if you can. Okay, and then we have shift uh, curves, and I'm sure uh, Paso went through this, so oftentimes they're in biochemistry. What kind of curve do you want? Uh, outside of the plate. No, we're talking left and right shifted curves. What kind do you want? You want a right shifted. You want to have hemoglobin that has decreased affinity for oxygen, so it wants to release oxygen to tissue. That's what you want. Okay, what's going to make it go that way? Well, that famous compound... Name it. 2,3-BPG, bisphosphoglycerate. Okay. What else? Fever does. What else? Low pH, which is acidosis. Right shifts the curve. That is correct. Okay. Now, what about... Oh, what's another thing that does that was recently on boards? High altitude. When you go into high altitude, it right shifts your curve. So you'll have a respiratory alkalosis. You have to hyperventilate in high altitude. Because why? You just told me a little while ago. What did I say happens when you decrease CO2 respiratory alkalosis? What happens to PO2? Ah, it goes up. Isn't that what happens when you're at high altitude? Ha, ha, ha. And then what else happens? You right shift your curve because high altitude causes an increase in synthesis of 2,3-BPG. That was a board question. That's how we can get oxygen up there. Hmm, very interesting. I think so, too. So what left shifts? Well, carbon monoxide left shifts, methemoglobin left shifts, hemoglobin F, fetal hemoglobin left shifts, decrease in 2,3 BPG. And what's the opposite of acidosis? Alkalosis, there you go. Alkalosis left shifts, that's bad. That's going to produce tissue hypoxia. So we have two, a double whammy with carbon monoxide so far. We got it decreasing oxygen saturation, and second, we have it left shifting the oxygen dissociation curve. That's not too cool. We got one more to go for carbon monoxide, don't we? Okay, so those are hemoglobin-related problems. Then we have the problems related to the oxidative pathway. Now, probably the most important one is cytochrome oxidase, which is the last enzyme before it transfers the electron to oxygen, which is an electron acceptor. And of course, there's two things. What I remember is the three C's. Cytochrome oxidase is the first one. And the next one is cyanide and carbon monoxide. Inhibit cytochrome oxidase. So just remember the three C's. Cytochrome oxidase, carbon monoxide, cyanide. We'll like each other. Okay. 
So we have a third thing for carbon monoxide producing tissue hypoxia. It blocks cyanide. I mean, it blocks cytochrome oxidase. So it, so it decreases O2 sat, so you can't carry a lot of oxygen. Less shifts your curve, so even what little you carry, you can't release. Okay? And then if you were able to release it, okay, it'd go to the end there and say, come on, electron. And no electron comes to it because you blocked the cytochrome oxidase and the whole system shuts down. You are screwed. Okay, so that's why carbon monoxide is such an important board question. Uncoupling you'll get when, uh, in biochemistry. Basically what it means is the ability for the uh, mitochondria and the inner mitochondrial membrane to synthesize ATP. What's happening is that the uh, inner mitochondrial membrane is permeable to protons. You only want protons to go through a certain hole in that membrane. And you want it to go through this pore at the base of which is ATP synthase and you're going to get ATP. You don't want protons just, just randomly going into the mitochondrial matrix because nothing's going to happen. That's what uncoupling agents do. Okay, examples would be dinitrophenol. This is chemical that they use for preserving wood. Uh, that does it. Uh, Alcohol is an uncoupling agent. Salicylates are uncoupling agents. It causes the protons to just go right through the membrane. Not cool. You're draining off all those protons and you're getting very little ATP from it. Well, since our body is in total equilibrium with each other, you start draining protons off, then those reactions that were generating the protons to begin with, those would include reactions that make NADH, and uh, uh, FAD, H, remember? Mm -hmm. Those are the protons that were delivered to the electron transport system, right? So the more, so any reaction that makes NADH and any reaction that makes FADH, okay, uh, any of those reactions, you're going to rev those reactions up when your protons are decreased. And so all the reactions start increasing, you know, to make more NADHs and FADHs to make more protons. Well, you all know from just simple chemistry that when you increase the rate of a chemical reaction, what happens to the temperature? It goes up. So what, do you, what risk do you have for this type of thing, please? Hyperthermia. Anyone that's been in the business of medicine a while, I'm sure some of you looks like may have been in that business for a while, knows that in salicylate toxicity, one of the complications is hyperthermia. That's because it's an uncoupling agent. And well, most of you probably know that if you're an alcoholic on a hot day, you have a good chance of developing a heat stroke because you already have uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation. And so to throw on top of that alcohol, which is, an, which is an uncoupling agent, you've got a bad situation. That's why alcoholics are so susceptible to heat stroke because their mitochondria already screwed up. Okay. So that's what uncoupling agents do. Very interesting. Thing. And then uh, arterial venous shunting, we won't mention that. So these are all the causes of tissue hypoxia. We started with ischemia, then we went to hypoxemia, respiratory acidosis, ventilation defect, perfusion defect, diffusion defect, hemoglobin-related things, anemia, carbon monoxide, methemoglobin, left-shifted curve, problems with cytochrome oxidase and blocking it, carbon monoxide, cyanide, and uncoupling agents. All those produce tissue hypoxia. All right, very important that you know those. Those are just absolute key things on boards, absolute key things. So let's see if you learn anything. Fill in the blanks. Respiratory acidosis, what happens to hemoglobin? Let's assume it's just acute respiratory acidosis. Nothing. What's going to happen to oxygen saturation? Decrease it. And what's going to happen to the partial pressure of oxygen? Decrease it. Okay, so you're going to decrease both oxygen saturation and PO2. Why is oxygen saturation decreased? because PO2 is decreased. Okay, anemia. What's the only one of these things, the three things that's going to be affected? Hemoglobin. Oxygen saturation, PO2 is? No, no. How about carbon monoxide and made hemoglobin? Does either of them have an effect on hemoglobin concentration? No. How about oxygen saturation? Yes. How about PO2? No. Very good. How do you treat uh, carbon monoxide poisoning? 100% oxygen. How do you treat methemoglobinemia? IV methylene blue. What else can you give as an ancillary treatment? Ascorbic acid. You got it. First concept finished. All right.
Now let's see what happens when you have a decrease in ATP, because you have tissue hypoxia, okay? Well, the biggest thing of these three things, and probably the only one, well, two biggest things, is that you have to go into anaerobic glycolysis. Now, I know you haven't had that yet, but anyone in this room that doesn't know what anaerobic glycolysis is is in big time trouble, okay? Remember, the end product of anaerobic glycolysis is lactic acid. Pyruvate is converted into lactate. Why? Because of an increase in NADH. So you need to, you need to make NAD because you're going to need to NAD to feed back into the glycolytic cycle so you can make two more ATP. You want to know why you have to use anaerobic glycolysis when you have tissue hypoxia? The answer is, is your mitochondria is the one that usually makes all your ATP, except there's one place you can get two ATP without going into the mitochondria. And where is it? It's an anaerobic glycolysis, which every cell can do, including RBCs. So you're surviving on two ATPs per glucose for your ATP if you have tissue hypoxia because your mitochondrial system is totally shut down. If there's no oxygen at the end of that electron transport system, you're screwed. You can only get two ATP without having to go through that system by anaerobic glycolysis. So what's the good news? The good news is you get two ATP. Okay, what's the bad news? You get a buildup of lactic acid in the cell and outside the cell, you all know that you have an increased that ion gap metabolic acidosis of tissue hypoxia. I mean, that's a given. You know that. And it's lactic acidosis from anaerobic glycolysis. But within a cell, it does havoc. An increase in acid in a cell will denature proteins. Okay? In other words, the structural proteins of a cell, denaturing it is not good. That's altering its configuration. It's screwing it up. And in terms of enzymes, it denatures them too. So that means that the cell can't even auto-digest itself anymore because its enzymes have been destroyed because of the buildup of acid. That's called coagulation necrosis, guys. So when you have tissue hypoxia, one of the things that can happen within a cell is coagulation necrosis, which is one of the types of necrosis that you need to know, of course. And when you, when you look at coagulation necrosis from a gross point of view as opposed to a, a microscopic point of view, that's termed infarction. Okay, so that's where we're going with that eventually. So a buildup of acid, lactic acid in a cell, produces what type of necrosis? Coagulation necrosis, that's correct. Okay. Second thing that happens when you lack ATP is all ATPase pumps are screwed up. Why? Because they run on ATP. That's the power. How do muscles work? ATP. How does everything work that needs energy? ATP. And we have these pumps. And we have a sodium-potassium pump. You already know about this pump because there's a certain drug that blocks it. It's called digitalis. And we block that, put that pump with digitalis to allow sodium to go into the, skin, into the cardiac muscle to open up what? Calcium channels so that you can get an increase in force of contraction. Am I correct? Isn't that what you learned in pharmacology? Yes or no? Okay. So sometimes you want the pump block. Okay. Sometimes you want to enhance it. Okay. But anyway, if there's no ATP, then what happens is sodium can get into the cell. But who does sodium always bring with it? Water. And so you're going to get cellular swelling. Now that's reversible. It won't kill you. They get swollen up a little bit, you know. Just have some uh, pretzels with a lot of salt tonight. Okay, you'll be a little swollen in the morning. Little eyelids will be all kind of fused shut. I mean, you're not dead, are you? <laughs> you're just kind of swollen up. Okay? That's the one they like the most on boys, is this pump. So when you have a tissue hypoxia, they can give you any scenario they want from the ones that we just discussed for tissue hypoxia. What's going to be happening in that cell? It's going to be swollen up. Why? Decrease ATP. So sodium goes into the cell. Now all you got to do is you get oxygen back and it'll pump it out. All that excess solid sodium and water and the cell goes back to normal. So it's totally reversible. Okay. So I think of these three things, the two most important one is that in tissue hypoxia, the cell has to undergo anaerobic glycolysis, and of course, the mature red blood cells doing that all the time. 
because the mature red blood cells don't have mitochondria. And so that's the main energy source right there. So that's a normal thing for red blood cells. It says, hey, I'm, in, I'm just in heaven. Okay, I'm just doing what I normally do, anaerobic glycolysis. Okay, but in other tissues, they don't like that. They'd rather have the whole thing going from pyruvate, not into lactate. They want it to be going into forming citrate and going into the TCA cycle. They want the citrate to go out into the cytosol, make some fatty acids. They want oh, the whole shish kebab, not lactic acid. <laughs> okay? All right. So this, these two things are the most important things uh, in terms of uh, tissue hypoxia and what happens. So we said that cellular swelling, of course, they give names in this in pathology, but they don't, they don't on boards. They just say cellular swelling. They don't use the terms like hydropic degeneration, crap like that. I mean, that's just junky stuff. They just say cellular swelling. In fact, they try to use very, very little uh, things that give away answers. Okay, so, all right, because in most of your courses, you had to memorize everything, right? Hydropic degeneration, you know. All these anchovy paste abscess. So now you're never going to see that crap. You're not going to see that stuff on this test. <laughs> a chance in God's green earth. No way. They're going to take all those little crutches that you use away from you and just describe them and not actually use those names. Corvoir searsign, the palpable gallbladder with carcinoma in the head of the pancreas. Forget it. Okay, there's going to be a guy with painless jaundice and a palpable gallbladder and, and a light-colored stool. They're not going to say a colic stools. No, no, no. They're just light-colored. And you have to come up with the fact it's carcinoma in the head of the pancreas. Okay. If you knew it was corvoir serous sign for the palpable gallbladder, but it ain't going to help you on the boards. Okay. Now, a cell without oxygen. Now that's coffee. Starbucks makes coffee. <laughs> Anything short of Starbucks is not coffee. Okay. It's just colored water. All right. Now you can prove me wrong by bringing some of your national brands, and I'll taste it and I'll be able to check it, but we'll see. I've had some good stuff from some Costa Rica. Somebody gave me some of the Costa Rica. Oh, food, that was wonderful. I mean, my hair went up. <laughs> this is good stuff. It's actually legal. All right. Don't have to worry about. It. Don't have to worry about shipping it into the country clandestinely. I mean, woo! Just give it to me. Is Mountain Dew for the little kids, and is that kind of coffee for us? Whoa! All right. So. A cell without, a, without oxygen for a while, it eventually things are irreversibly going to occur. And they, they're interested in this, too. One of the big actors for uh, irreversible change is calcium. They really like to you know what happens to calcium in tissue hypoxia. The answer is it enters cells. Actually, there's a pump, just like there's a sodium potassium ATPase pump, there's a calcium ATPase pump also. And so what happens is if ATPs, if ATPs decrease, calcium now has easy access to the cell. And when it's in a cell, it's like, it's unbelievable. It activates all these enzymes. It activates phospholipases in the cell membrane. That's not cool. It's going to cause damage to the cell membrane. It's going to activate uh, enzymes in the nucleus. That's not cool because you're going to end up getting nuclear pycnosis and eventual uh, the nucleus, nuclear chromatin just plain disappears. It goes into the mitochondria. Oh, God, it just has a blast in there. That's like a kid going to McDonald's in one of those, you know, tube things. You know, oh, no, look at it. It just destroys the mitochondria. So it activates enzymes. Calcium's famous for that. You all know that hypercalcemia produces acute pancreatitis. And maybe, that can, maybe you just put something together now for the first time. It can activate your actual enzymes in your stinking pancreas. And you get an acute pancreatitis from hypercalcemia. So it's no, no small wonder that if it goes into a cell, it does the same stinking thing. Okay? So that's one of the key things for reducing irreversible change is our little friend calcium. Of the two that get damaged, that's the worst thing to get damaged. I think cell membrane is the worst. Because that's the thing that's, that's preventing bad things from the outside from getting into a cell. So if you start destroying that, your cells irreversibly damaged. But then to add insult to injury and knock off the mitochondria, the energy-producing factory, it's all over. It's all over. 
Okay, so all those skins are irreversible when you screw up the cell membrane. And when our little friend calcium gets in, does its thing, it's all over. Cell diet. A lot of times it releases enzymes. We all know those different enzymes, CK. And the CKMB for myocardial infarction could release that. Could release transaminases and hepatitis, SGOT or ALT or ASD, ALT, those kinds of things, amylase and pancreatitis, those kinds of things can get released when that tissue, that cell dies. Okay? So that's that concept. Two others, and uh, we're away from tissue hypoxia right now, is uh, free radicals. Free radicals are very important. Uh, this little, we'll slip it up over here, is showing a liver in a person that has this kind of uh, brownish pigment very commonly seen in uh, older people when their organs undergo atrophy. Uh, this is called lipofuscin, the so-called wear and tear pigment. Now you can't look at that and tell me that's lipofuscin without history, because that could just as easily be hemosiderin and hemochromatosis and hemosiderosis. It could easily even be bilirubin. So you would need more information to be able to say that's what it was. But what I'm basically saying is that when you have free radical damage, one of the end products of that is uh, lipofuscin because certain things in a cell are not digestible. And those include lipids. And so that's what lipofuscin is. It's a lipids that you just can't break down all the way. Now, what is a free radical? A free radical is a, is a, a compound that has an unpaired electron in its outer orbit. Well, that's not cool. That makes it very unstable. Okay, it means it's going to damage something because it's just not all there, you know. If we have an unpaired electron in our brains, what happens? We do crazy things, you know. And so it's, it's, it's going to damage things. Now, interestingly, what are we breathing right now? Oxygen. Oxygen can be a free radical. No. Yeah. You give someone 50% or higher oxygen... For any period of time, they're going to get superoxide free radicals. Is that bad? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Ever heard of reperfusion injury? You know, when we give our tissue plasminogen activator for somebody that has a coronary thrombus and we try to dissolve that thrombus, and we do most of the time, and oxygenated blood goes back into that, that damaged cardiac muscle. Have you ever heard of the reperfusion injury? Do you think that maybe involves oxygen free radicals? Oh, yeah. It really does a job in those injured cells and knocks some of them off. Mm -hmm. And then if you can know about kids with respiratory distress syndrome, they can end up with oxygen-related uh, free radical injury. They can go blind. Okay, the free oxygen free radicals can destroy the retina. That's called, uh, that used to be called retrolenal fibroplasia. Now it's called retinopathy of prematurity. It also can produce uh, damage to your lungs. It's called bronchopulmonary dysplasia where you get fibrosis in your lungs. You have chronic crippling lung disease from that. Oh, so it's not good. So oxygen is a free radical. And then water in our tissues can be converted into um, hydroxyl free radicals. Now, that's what ionizing radiation does. That's not UVB light. That's non-ionizing radiation. When you get radiated for a cancer, you get hydrolysis of water, you form hydroxyl free radicals. And they can produce mutations in, in, uh, in uh, those tissues. And you all know that a complication of radiation therapy is cancer. Most common cancer in radiation, please? Leukemia. Mm -hmm. So that's, did it because of free radicals, hydroxyl free radicals. Iron loves to make free radicals. It has a reaction called a Fenton reaction. That's what makes iron overload diseases so dangerous. Because wherever tissue iron is located, you're going to get hydroxyl free radicals, and they're going to damage that tissue. If you've got it in your liver, you're going to get cirrhosis. If you have it in your heart, you're going to get restrictive cardiomyopathy. If you get it in your pancreas, it ain't going to work anymore. And you're going to get malabsorption, and you're going to get diabetes. So we'll take this story up after our 10-minute break. <laughs>